Good morning, friends. If you have an inquiring mind, you, you may wonder why we read certain passages of Scripture uh, before the sermon every week. Uh, and just to let you know, they're just not randomly chosen uh, to take up the hour and 15 minutes that we're going to be here. Uh, we actually uh, have an intended purpose for the scripture reading. And today, we're, we heard from Isaiah 35, and, and you will see a direct and impressive connection to the passage in Mark 7 that we're going to be studying together. And again, as I've said recently a few times, our, our liturgy, the, the way we work our way through the elements of the service, uh, are designed to accomplish certain things in your heart and to lead you uh, to a better understanding of Christ as your Lord and Savior and to um, embrace Him for all that He is. And as we begin to think about our text this morning in Mark chapter 7, I want to ask you uh, whether or not you wished you could do all things well. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure some of you think you already do most things well, uh, but uh, I mean all things. Don't you wish you could do all things well, or at least don't you wish your spouse could do all things well, maybe a few things well? Uh, I've, I've caught myself wishing that our politicians would do just one or two things well, especially of late. But just think how good life would be if you and those in your life could do all things well. I mean, it would, it would feel a little bit like Isaiah 35, wouldn't it, on this planet? Doing all things well. And of course, we know that there's only one who does all things well, right? We've been singing about him, praying to him, worshiping him this morning. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. He didn't just do things okay or adequately like we may do. He did all things well. If your Bible is open to Mark chapter 7, I want to just read one section here, I'll go back and read the whole thing in a, in a second, but Mark chapter 7, verse 37 says this, And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. Jesus did everything well. There wasn't one thing that he did adequately or okay. Everything was well that he put his hand to. And what a savior we have. In order to benefit from the well that Jesus did and does, I want to communicate to you today that you must be united to him. As long as you are not united to him, the well that he does is only circumstantial as it goes with your experience. But to experience all the well that Jesus has done and is doing, you have to be united with him. And, and if we want to be conformed to his image so that we begin to do all things well more often, then we have to be united to him. And I think you'll see that today as we work our way through the text. Let me read it for you. Mark chapter 7, verse 31 through 37. Then he, that is Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them 
to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. That's just an example of how well Jesus does things. And of course, we've seen these and greater things, haven't we, already as in our, in our study of the Gospel of Mark. What we've been learning from Mark is that because Jesus does all things well in every category, he is the only solution to the chaos the world faces, the only solution to the chaos you face. There's one solution, and it's the only one who does all things well, that is Jesus Christ. We're, we're at a critical point in Mark's gospel where Jesus' Galilean ministry, that's the ministry up north, is coming to a close. The training of his disciples is, is ramping up significantly, and they have learned that Jesus is something special. I mean, how could you follow a guy around like Jesus who does all things well for 18 months and not figure out at least that there's something special about him? Maybe even he's the long-awaited Messiah had begun to cross their minds. Our story today takes place in a Gentile territory, the Decapolis, which was to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And it seems that, that Jesus was on a kind of a, a Gentile ministry trip here uh, in Mark 7. If you remember last week, we studied the story of the Syphophoenician woman uh, who had great faith. Um, she came and, and spoke with Jesus uh, from the city of Tyre, and which was in modern-day southern Lebanon, which was then, even today, uh, Gentile territory. Jesus was there ministering to the Gentiles, uh, showing his disciples that he came not just for Israel, but for the entire world, for all Gentiles, including you and me who are sitting in this room. And now this story turns to the Decapolis. And I want you to notice what, what Mark says in verse 31. He, he said that Jesus returned from the region of Tyre, went through Sidon. Now, if you know your geography, uh, Sidon is north of Tyre. So instead of going back home to Galilee and Capernaum and uh, that region, he went north. So he went from Tyre on the, on the Mediterranean Sea, north to Sidon, then southeast back home. So he went further into Gentile territory before he went to the Decapolis. So he is intently training his disciples about God's love for the Gentile people, showing them what their ministry will be about as well in coming days. Jesus was on a Gentile ministry trip. An interesting point to this story is this location of the Decapolis. Some of you may remember having heard about the Decapolis in our earlier study of the Gospel of Mark. Do you remember the, the guy we called Crazy Carl from the Gadarenes? That was the area of the Decapolis. This is where Jesus returned to. Now after months of Crazy Carl, who had been transformed by Christ's love and power, had been evangelizing his home area or home region of the Decapolis. Come to find out, Crazy Carl had been effective and faithful. The people knew who Jesus was, and they brought this mute, deaf man to Jesus because they knew he could do something about it. If he did this for Carl, look what he can do for this guy. This is what we see here. The condition of this man in our story today was severe. He was completely deaf and mute. It, the speech impediment thing is a kind English translation for totally mute. He couldn't speak because he was totally deaf, which means he was totally deaf probably his entire life. Um, it was a sad case. Being deaf and mute in the first century was really a lonely death sentence. But remember, Jesus does all things well. Jesus 
took this man aside, it says here in our passage, away from the crowd privately to give him close personal attention to a man who no doubt was hurting deeply, most likely been ignored his whole life by everyone, probably even his family, had been shunned, scorned, ridiculed, ostracized, despised, and in the first century, these folks were considered mentally disabled. But in that moment, he had Jesus' undivided attention. Jesus put his fingers, his own fingers, into this deaf man's ears and then touched this deaf man's tongue and looked up to heaven to communicate to this man that he was about to rescue him from his darkness, rescue him from his utter silence and personal chaos. He was about to do something well. None of these signals that we read of here in these verses healed the deaf mute man. They just were made to communicate with this man that he was soon to be rescued. I want you to put yourself in this man's shoes if you can. I want you to think about what was happening. Jesus communicated with this man the only way that this man knew. Sign language, pointing, touching, and he used these nonverbal signals, these gestures, to help this man understand that he was about to be rescued and he was about to experience the love of God in a way that he never had. And so I want to, I want to show you a few things from this text about Christ that I think will, will further impress upon your heart your need to be united to him, not just so you can experience all things well as he intends you to, but so that you'll become like him. You'll be conformed to his image and maybe do things a little more well yourself. First, I want you to see the compassion of Christ. Evidently, this man had some friends. They brought him to Jesus, right? We, we, we've seen this before. Remember the lame man who was lowered down through the roof? These folks couldn't get to Jesus on their own, and so their friends stepped in. Their friends were in the gap for them. When they heard that Jesus was in town, they, they took him to Jesus and begged Jesus to help because they'd heard Carl say things about Jesus' abilities. And so they brought their friend, this deaf mute man, because he couldn't bring himself. And I'm, I'm sure that there's people in our lives, your life, my life, that are unable to bring themselves to Christ, which is why Jesus has placed us in their lives so that we can bring them to Christ, as this man's friend did. So how did Jesus demonstrate compassion in this story? Well, it's on the surface, right? It's eye level. But let me just say it um, to make a point. The first thing we see is he demonstrated compassion by touching the man, by the touch. We've become familiar with this action, this response from Jesus, haven't we? He was always touching people, physically touching people, especially hurting people, especially those who hadn't been touched physically by others. He touched the blind, the lame, the leprous, the poor, the sick regularly. When all others would recoil at someone's looks or condition, Jesus moved forward towards them to touch, to embrace, to reassure, to heal, to restore, to love. Remember that he does all things well. He embraces the most needy. He embraces the reviled, the most despised. Those are the ones that are a magnet to Jesus. Remember Mark 141 when Jesus encountered this man with leprosy and this man said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And remember what Jesus said? I am willing. And he touched him. Be clean, he says. So why did Jesus touch people so often? Well, first of all, to communicate love and compassion. This is what human touch does. It communicates something non-verbally that words cannot, the human touch. This wasn't the same kind of touch that we use to pick up a piece of trash on the street, doing our best not to touch it. You've done this, right? 
Uh, if you have children, you've done this with diapers. It's like, ugh, you know, that kind of thing. No, Jesus' touch on undesirables was a warm embrace. An important note about Jesus' touch is that he never needed to touch anyone or anything. He proved that he could heal from a distance. He proved this in the last section of Scripture. The Syphophoenician's daughter was demon-possessed. He said, go home, she's well. Jairus' daughter, go home, he's, she's well. From a distance. He didn't have to touch people. So why did he touch people? To communicate love in a way that words cannot. He wanted each of those he touched to know that he cared deeply for them. This is why he came. We heard it referenced earlier. For God so loved the world that he came. Why did he come? Because he loved the world. He loves us. So why did Jesus touch people? To show them love and compassion. Secondly, he touched people to give an example to follow. We need examples. And here, Jesus is a great one. What an example. We see here, one of the most important and powerful ministry tools that we possess are these things at the end of our arms called hands. That's one of the most important ministry tools you possess. And we all have them. All given to be used for the encouragement of people in the glory of God. Take my hands and let them be, we sing, don't we? Yes, we need to touch people. They need to know through our touch that we care and love them. I know that we have a lot of Germans in the crowd. I'm one of them. Um, and we need to respect each other's boundaries uh, to a degree. Uh, but we need to learn to express our affection for one another through some form of touch. Maybe you're not into the full frontal hug as some of you enjoy. Um, which I'm fine with, from some of you. So. <laughs> but, but we must take this gift that God has given us, our hands, and touch one another. If we're going to follow the example of Christ, we need to touch one another. We need to touch people. We need to take this with us into the streets, into places where undesirables like this man was, here in our city and touch people physically to our places of work, reach out to our neighbors, our friends, and touch people physically. And we see the example here. I think it's hard to effectively share the love of Christ without a physical touch. We must be willing to get our hands dirty, literally. One of the most powerful demonstrations of Christ's love that I experienced growing up was when my Dad uh, took me with him to downtown Quito, Ecuador. I think it was around eight years old or something like that. Uh, my dad had seen a man who was living underneath a staircase on a piece of uh, cardboard. He lived in squalor and his clothes were rags. He hadn't shaved in months as far as I could tell. Needless to say, he didn't smell very good. Um, we went and physically picked up this man. I don't know why my dad took me other than to be an example to me as Christ was. But we went and physically picked this man up who could hardly walk, and we took him home with us. My dad gave this man a bath and shaved him and bought him some new clothes and fed him a few meals and gave him some money. Then we told him about Jesus. I, had, I hadn't remembered that for years until I started studying this. I went, oh yeah. This is... I've seen this firsthand. So what we see here, the compassion of Christ is communicated through touch, physical touch. Secondly, we see this compassion of Christ revealed in the side. You see that? He looked up to heaven and sighed. He looked up to heaven and went, oh, what was that? I'm so tired of these people. No, that wasn't it. 
I'm so tired of this. No. <laughs> no. The sigh communicates compassion as well. It communicates the sympathy of Christ for his fallen creation, for our condition. Sin has damaged us. Sin had damaged this man. Sin had, had damaged the Pharisees. Sin had damaged everybody Jesus encountered. Sin has damaged each and every one of us in this room. And Jesus sighs about it. Oh, it saddened Jesus. Jesus' sympathy and com compassion motivated him to minister to the needy. We see this all over the Gospels. His love for Lazarus, his sympathy, sympathy for Lazarus' sisters caused him to weep and then restore Lazarus to life. Why? Because he loved him. So Jesus, we see him weeping over people, weeping over cities. His love, his compassion, his sympathy moved him to touch and restore and sigh over the conditions that he saw. He came to earth motivated by these things. Remember, he does all things well, for God so loved the world. Faber wrote this, <clears throat> There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than in heaven. Sun Valley, if we want to be emissaries for Christ, we must share his compassion for hurting people. We, we live in a hurting world. We pass by or live by or work with wounded, weary, hurting people every single day. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are merciful. Matthew 5. Are we compassionate? Are you compassionate? Are we a compassionate church? When people think of Sun Valley, do they think, uh, uh, doctrinal people? Or do they think compassionate people? I'd rather they think compassionate people. In fact, our doctrine should drive our compassion. <laughs> if it doesn't, we got something wrong. Do we sigh over the devastation of sin that we encounter daily? Do we weep over the divorce we see, the poverty, the homelessness, the abortion, the disease-wracked people that we encounter every single day? Does it affect us or are we callous to it because we see it so often? Do we see our world through the eyes of Jesus? Jesus sighed here in verse 34, recorded by Mark, observed by Peter. Peter told Mark about this. Because Jesus' sympathy for the effects of sin on the human race. This is why he sighed. Look around you at what sin has done to us, to you, to your family, to your neighbors, to our city, to our nation to our world. Look at what sin has done. Does it cause sadness? Does it cause compassion? Or are you revolted by it? All the actions of, and all the actions and words rather of Jesus, all the things that he did with this man were examples for us, his church. We must look on each other with sympathy, with compassion, be quick to touch, be quick to encourage, be quick to speak words of life, just like did, Jesus did with this poor man. We must do with each other and with our city, with our neighbors. So the compassion of Jesus here in this story is seen in the look the look, the sigh, the touch, and then, of course, the healing. Do you see the healing? <laughs> Is this not 
compassion. Jesus said in Aramaic, Ephetha, which means be opened. These words spoken by Jesus weren't heard by the man. Why? Because he was deaf. He didn't hear the words, but you know what did hear the words? Ephetha? The man's auditory nerve endings. And they responded immediately. So this man saw Jesus' lips move, and then he began to hear. Because his nerve endings responded to their creator. Of course, Christ's word in and of itself was sufficient to heal. He proved this over and over and over again throughout the Gospels. We can also minister sufficiently with the words of Christ. We, we should be speaking the words of Christ into each other's lives. We're sending emails or texts of Bible verses and so forth to one another. These are good things. God's word is a critical factor in solving chaos, after all. Jesus' words healed this man. It demonstrated his compassion. His words continue to heal both physically and spiritually today. But Jesus added all of what we've seen in this story. The touch, the sigh, the look to his words. And he expects us to do the same. Jesus expects us to minister to people like he did. With touch, with compassion, with words of life. Do people around you know that you love them? Oh, sure they do. Look, I mean, look what I do. Look what I do. I bring home a check. I mean, pfft. do they know you love them? Have you prayed for them? Do they know you've prayed for them? Have you touched them? Have you shared Christ's words with them? Do you have compassion for them, especially if they don't know Jesus? When Jesus restored this man, he commanded his ears to be opened. The same moment, the man's tongue was freed. In verse 32, Mark uses the word impediment. He had a speech impediment, which I told you earlier uh, was a, a kind translation of what it meant. This man was mute. It, the word actually means in bonds, in chains. He, he had, his speech was bonded. It was under wraps of chain. Um, this man had been in this situation for his whole life, and in this moment, he was freed. Think about that. As Jesus' miracles go, not only was this man given his hearing back, but also he immediately learned language. He hadn't heard language his entire life, and yet he speaks plainly. That's a miracle. Let's all say together in unison, uh, Merry Christmas in Mandarin, okay? One, two, three. <laughs> exactly. You've never heard Merry Christmas in Mandarin, probably because they don't say that often, but also because you haven't heard it. This man hadn't heard a word his entire life. And yet, when his ears were opened, so was his tongue, so was his brain, and he spoke plainly. He learned language immediately. That's pretty well, isn't it? All things he does well. Instead of just healing his hearing, now go learn language. Could have been the healing. Would have been impressive enough. Would have been okay. But Jesus does all things well. This, does this miracle mean that this man was spiritually healed? Mark doesn't, doesn't tell us, but we know from church history that the first cent in the first century here in this region, the Decapolis, a very strong Gentile church grew. In this region, where Crazy Carl was and Mute Matt, Gentiles came to Christ in droves throughout the first century. Did, was this man saved? Probably. 
He was healed physically and spiritually in a moment. Now, of course, we can't offer physical healing as Jesus did, but we can offer the most important type of healing that Jesus offered, and that is spiritual healing, can't we? We can offer that. We bring people to Jesus. That's how we offer it. We tell them about Christ. We, we love them as Christ loves us. You see, Jesus solves spiritual chaos today. And of course, when Jesus solves spiritual chaos, guess what follows on its heels? Physical chaos. Do you know why you have a decent marriage or a good marriage? It's because you've experienced spiritual healing. Do you know why you have anything good physically, really? Is because of the love of God. We all know people in spiritual chaos, don't we? I've got neighbors on each side of me in the midst of spiritual chaos. We all know that Jesus is the only solution to that chaos. Jesus is the only hope that they have. He does all things well. We ought to maybe think about bringing them to Jesus because they can't get there on their own. Let's look now at the dependency of Jesus. We see this also in the look. He looked up to heaven, it says in verse 34. What did this mean? Why did he do this? Well, I have some ideas here. First of all, I think it communicates that he communed with his father. He looked to heaven to communicate that he was in communion with the one that sent him. He was in communion with the Father. We know from reading the gospel accounts that Jesus was in constant communion with his Father, was constantly praying, was constantly referring to his relationship with his Father. Even though Jesus was busy doing the will of the Father, he never overlooked his communion with the Father. Do you catch yourself ever being so busy with the will of God that you forget to commune with God? I do. We, we can learn from this, can't we? Even though we are working hard at fulfilling God's will for our lives in parenting, in spousing, in ministry, in evangelism, we can fail to communicate or commune with the one we are representing. Our service for him is never more than our communion with him. You think you can serve him without communing? Think again. You can't. Being so busy doing the right things that we fail to commune with the one for whom we are doing them is missing something very important. We can't afford to be prayerless parents, prayerless employees, prayerless pastors, and prayerless people. He communed with the Father, and he communicated that with this look. This look also communicated that he depended on the Father. He not only communed with the Father, he depended on the Father daily. Do you catch yourself doing all the right things in your own strength? If the Holy Spirit were to leave you, how long would it take you to recognize that he was gone? Jesus depended on the Father daily, minute by minute. Third and finally, I want you to look at the strategy of Christ. And this was where we're going to fold in Isaiah 35. But before that, I want you to notice that Jesus told them not to tell anybody that he had healed this man. You see that? Tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Now, think about this with me. Just a few months earlier, he had rescued Crazy Carl, the demon-possessed man, and he told him just the opposite. 
didn't he? He said, go into the Decapolis and tell everybody what I've done for you. He tells this guy, don't you tell a soul. What's the story? <laughs> well, uh, he liked Carl. He didn't like this guy, right? No, that's not what it was. Carl was at the beginning of his ministry, and he needed the word to get out so that when he showed up to the Decapolis a second and third time, people were ready for him. They knew who he was. They were anxious to be with him, to be ministered to by him. Now that that had been accomplished, what do we see? We see here Jesus saying, now I don't want you to tell anybody. And now listen closely as to why. Okay, Jesus was on a timetable. He needed to die when he did. Remember, he's halfway through his ministry, going from Galilee down to Jerusalem. He's heading south to die. He was on a timetable. He needed to die when he did, where he did, and how he did. And if Jesus is sovereign, he controlled each of those things. When, where, and how. Jesus needed to die when he did, which was during the Passover celebration to fulfill the picture of the sacrificial lamb of the Old Testament sacrificial system, which is why John the Baptist said when he first introduced Jesus in John chapter 1, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He needed to die when he did, at the Passover in a year and a half. He needed to die where he did because of the foretelling of the location of his death in Genesis 22, among other places, when Abraham took Isaac to this identical location in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, which is called Mount Zion. And what did Abraham call that mountain? It will be provided. Abraham, who lived centuries before Christ, was told by God to go to Mount Moriah, the exact location where Jesus would die in centuries to come and sacrifice his only son Isaac, which is a type of Christ. And of course, God intervened and he didn't have to do that. And, but the example was set. The picture was drawn. The type was in place. And here now, Jesus is saying, I need to die because of what I told Abraham centuries ago on where it would be provided. On this mount, it would be provided. Jesus needed to die when he died on the Passover, where he died on Mount Moriah. And so he tells the, these, this group of people who, he just, who witnessed him heal this deaf mute man, keep it to yourself. Finally, he had to die how he died. How did he die? Crucifixion. He, he died under the Roman rule on a cross to fulfill the prophecies concerning his death on a tree. It was prophesied that he would die on a tree. Not being pushed over a cliff like they wanted to in Nazareth, not by stoning as they wanted to in Jerusalem, but on a tree. When, where, and how. Strategic timing. Keep this to yourself. I, I've got a plan. So after healing this man, the crowd was exceedingly, it says, super abundantly, it means, astonished. They were blown away, in other words, which is why they declared, he has done all things well. And keep in mind, these were Gentiles, not Jews. And this leads us finally to Isaiah 35 and the strategic events surrounding this miraculous healing. Isaiah 35, as you heard read earlier, describes the millennial kingdom. What we read or what we heard read from Isaiah 35 is what will happen when Jesus returns and sets up his thousand year reign, the millennial kingdom, which is yet to come. Mark intentionally uses a rare word in Greek that is translated mute, and it so happens to be the identical word that Isaiah used in 35. 
And he did that intentionally. Of course, Isaiah was writing in Hebrew, but when translated into the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's translated mute, the word that Mark used in Greek. And so Mark intentionally does this to point our vision backwards to Isaiah 35 and forwards to the millennial kingdom. This is the one who is coming. This is the one who was promised. This is the one who takes mute people and makes them sing. This is the one who takes deaf people and makes them hear. This is what we read in Isaiah 35. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Mark says, listen, this is the one who does all things well. This is the only solution to the world's chaos. This is the promised one. This is our Messiah. This is your Savior. Pay attention. He does all things well. What a wonderful picture of Christ. He, Mark saying that what Jesus was doing in the first century Israel was a preview of that great day when Jesus will return in glory and power and usher in that millennial kingdom in which we will reign with him. Those of us who have embraced him, those of us who have been touched by him. Have you been touched by Christ? Have you embraced Christ? then you will reign with Christ in this joyful, exuberant time called the Millennial Kingdom. Everything will be done well in this kingdom. Friends, all of us who are united to him will be completely restored. Are you looking forward to that day? I know I am. Come on, restoration. All will be well for those who have been touched by Jesus. He solves chaos everywhere he goes. One day, all the chaos will be solved. There will be no more chaos to solve. It will be a job well done. Aren't you looking forward to that day? I am. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, we indeed look forward to this great day where you are completing this job that you've done so well. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son in love to accomplish all these good things. Father, I pray that, <clears throat> that we will each understand clearly our need to be united to this one, to our Savior Jesus Christ, to the one who does all things well, beginning with our salvation. I pray that if there be any person in this room who has yet to embrace him, that the words here in Mark 7, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through the conviction of that same Spirit, impact the heart and convert the soul. For those of us who already know Jesus, uh, Father, I pray that, that we will follow this wonderful example of Christ delivered to us faithfully by Mark's pen, that we would be people just like Christ, who love others, who are faithful, who bring our friends to Jesus, who touch, who love, who care. I pray this in the name of our great Savior who does all things well. Amen.